speak really loudly because the other panels I've been in are totally paid for. Grump. Grump. Yes, grumpy. Grumpy. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear Hello. me now? Oh, much better. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> this is amplification. The welcome to the 22nd century. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome this afternoon to this interview with Ian Waits. We are delighted to have him as a guest of honour, <coughs> writer, editor and publisher extraordinaire. So welcome Ian, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. So we're going to start today with a reading from Ian's newest book. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Okay, this, this is... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read a, a, a very short piece, so don't worry, it's not going to take a thousand hours. It's a very um, short book. It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but th this particular piece is a piece in which nothing whatsoever happens. So be prepared to be on the edge of your seat, totally thrilled, raring to go, and um, yeah, here we go. <laughs> this is a, where our main character is going from one place to another. So as you can imagine, it's going to be riveting stuff, folks. <laughs> I would love to claim that after a period of steady climbing, my steed brought me to the summit of a hill, where I was able to pause and look back, contemplating the picturesque vista of a wooded valley through which the ale flowed serenely, its surface sparkling in the sunlight. Sadly, the truth was far more prosaic. The river's course soon disappeared from sight behind the treetops, while every time I hoped we might have reached the hill's crest, it proved to be no more than a cruel tease, merely a fold in the landscape beyond which yet another slope waited to be mastered. As we climbed higher, the nature of the trees started to change. They grew squatter, their crowns lower, and the spread of their boughs broader. Nor were these the only differences. Before long, they adopted a rather singular form of adornment. Draped from every branch, or so it seemed, were veils of silk and webbing, as if the whole woodland had been wrapped and bundled up in preparation for storage, but then, set to one side and forgotten about, left in plain sight for the whole world to marvel at. A spiderwood. Had I realised this was here, I would have delayed leaving the river and chosen a different course. These places always gave me the creeps. I recall my first encounter with a spiderwood. As, as a boy, I'd been enchanted, imagining this, imagining this to be the home of fairies who sought to ward their realm in a vast wall of gossamer thread to keep the rest of the world at bay. Only later did I learn of the far more sinister giant arachnoids, said to be the true masters of such places. Oddly, I had yet to meet anyone who had actually seen one of these malevolent creatures. No one worthy of giving credence to at any rate. Plenty of folk who claimed to know the second cousin of a woman whose best friend's brother once met a man who swore blind that he'd fought his way free of a spiderwood ahead of a pack of blood-crazed, sharp-fanged monstrosities, barely escaping with their life and the odd rascal professing personal knowledge of the mysterious realms that lay beyond the webbing. Invariably, such individuals were in possession of both a vivid imagination and a raging thirst, but no one remotely convincing. There was a tale of a village somewhere to the north, Hartsbury, if memory serves, that had fallen, that had been built in the shadow of a spiderwood. Some local lord took it into their head that deep within that impenetrable cluster of trees there rested a great trove of treasure jealously guarded by the woodland's eight-legged denizens, in much the same way a dragon might have cover its hoard, covet its hoard. So obsessed was he with this notion that he worked tirelessly to convince others, filling their heads with dreams of wealth. Soon he had all the villagers believing the tale. One fine summer's day, fired up on by his seductive fancies, and undoubtedly fueled by too much sour meat and scrumpy, they determined to flush out the woods custodians and seize the treasure for themselves. Urged on by their lord, the villagers had set light to the woodland. Now this was following a period of protracted drought, so the trees and the brush all caught readily. The villagers watched and laughed and drank, anticipating their eminent wealth. But fire is a capricious ally, reluctant to follow direction, and the flames soon rampaged out of control, spreading like, well, wildfire. Before the villagers knew it, the conflagration threatened to engulf their very homes. Drawing water from wells at both ends of the small settlement, they did their best, flinging bucket after bucket at the flames. But they might as well have tried to douse a dragon's breath by spitting. Finally, the fire burnt out. 
but not before it had consumed the entire woodland, the village, their meagre attempt at agriculture, and much of the wild grassland beyond. Those responsible never saw any giant spiders, concluding that any such must have perished in the flames, nor did they find any treasure, just a vast swathe of blackened earth. All that remained to indicate where their homes had once stood were a few charred splinters of stunted wall. With their homes gone, no hunting to be had and no crops to support them, the community disintegrated, the people drifting away to settle elsewhere. But almost at once, shoots of green began to appear as saplings emerged from the seared earth. In a surprisingly short time, a green mantle of fresh growth had spread across the blackened land as the woodland started to renew itself. Most mysterious of all, as the trees grew ever taller with each passing season, the veils of webbing reappeared. Things had returned to their prior state as if the fire had never happened. The only significant change was that the woodland had now expanded slightly, reaching out to reclaim the land formerly occupied by the village. The moral of this tale has always seemed pretty obvious to me, leave well enough to, alone, a principle I'm more than happy to abide by where spiderwoods are concerned. We passed the long stretch of brooding trees without incident, though my sense of being watched had returned, stronger than ever, and this time it wasn't the prospect of human pursuit that made me jumpy. As soon as the spiderwood was behind us, my spirits rose considerably, and I chided myself for succumbing to such irrational fears. I didn't believe in giant arachnids any more than I believed in tree meisters or fairies. Such tales were for the young and the gullible, not a seasoned warrior such as me. So there you go, a chapter in which nothing happens. Thank you very much for that, that was lovely. So, can you tell us about how you started writing? Oh, I, I, I've written all my life. I mean, I, I started writing when I was still at school and um, I entered a competition called the Lord Mayor's Prize for English, which is no longer in existence, long gone. Um, which, but all the schools in uh, London were entitled to join. And I, I sent a story in and I won. So I ended up collecting a, um, a prize from the Lord, then Lord Mayor of London at Mansion House. And um, I've really written ever since, you know, so it's just something that I've always done. <coughs> I've always done. What is it that you love about it? I've I always read copiously ever since I was a small child, and it, it, I, that would fire off images in my mind, imagination, etc. And I would invent my own stories, perhaps inspired by whatever, perhaps not. I don't know, but it gave me an opportunity to put that down on paper in such a way that I could then um, look at it myself and remind myself, but also share it with other people. Um, it's really an expression of of, of crazy things are going up there. <laughs> <laughs> so you're known for writing at multiple different lengths. Do you have a preferred format? Is there one that you're more comfortable with than the others? At different times, yes, as a general rule, no. I mean, to, put, to, to explain what I mean, when I determined that I wanted to become a writer and I chucked in the day job, which was I ran a financial services company and got so tired of the bureaucracy and the red tape and it was driving me to frustration. And my far, far better half, Helen, said, well, you always said you wanted to be a writer. Throw it all in and be a writer. You know, I'm, I'm a nurse. I, I will we'll live off my salary. And that's what we did. And I started writing short stories. But that was purely and simply because I didn't feel I had the chops, the writing chops, to write a novel. Um, and I felt if I could <clears throat> master the short story format, where you have to be so much more concise, so much more um, economical with your use of words, if I could master that and make a success of that, then hopefully I could then progress from there onto the novel, which I'm not the first person to go that route, um, and, but it's a fairly outmoded route these days, but it's what, what worked for me. So I started writing short stories. I started sending them out initially just to age myself this before the internet really worked. So I'd send off to Asimovs and three months later get a rejection, this sort of thing. But then when the internet came, I thought, great, I can do things instantly. Um, and I started sending off a lot of short stories I got some rejected, I got some accepted. Um, but I set myself a target one year where I wanted to write a short story a month and sell a short story a month. And I managed both. I wrote 13 and I sold 13. Uh, not the same ones. Some of these were stories which I'd had previously. Um, but I had enough professional sales that it qualified me to become um, a member of SAFWA, which at the time you had to have so many professional sales. Um, having done that, I'd started going to conventions 
had my arm twisted into it by Mr. Watson over there, who said, why didn't you come to a science fiction convention? And I thought, no, it's where everyone dressed up as Wookiees and Star Trek, not for me. I, I went along and found quite the opposite and, and had a great time and I've been going ever since. Um, but by doing that, I'd started to meet agents and I started to meet publishers. And once I felt that I'd got, um, I, had, I think I had about two dozen published short stories, one of which had somehow found its way onto the BSFA award shortlist. So I, I went to some of these agents and said, look, I've started to write a novel, would you like to see it? And agents and publishers both said yes. But I, I will just, as a coder to that, I did find that I, I ended up in the strange situation where I had two publishing contracts to two different uh, publishers. One which was to Angry Robot, who were part of HarperCollins at the time, and one was to Solaris, who were part of, part of Black Library at the time. Both have since changed. Um, but I, I spent, therefore, the next, I don't know, three years writing one novel in one, one novel in the other, one novel in one, etc. I then came to the end of those contracts, thought, great, I'm going to take a breather from uh, novels and write short stories. Could I heck? Everything I wrote was suddenly novel length. <laughs> and, you know, the ideas. and it took a while to get the mental processes back to writing the more concise form of story again. So I, I love writing both. I love writing novellas. But it does almost seem to be that there is a switch that you have to somehow operate to move between one and the other, for me at least. So when an idea occurs to you, do you think, ah, this is a short story, or this one's got legs, this should be a novel? Do yeah. you know that from the very beginning? Quite, quite often. I mean, I, I, my first series, which were published by Angry Robot, was set in this um, realm I called the City of a Hundred Roads, which is a city built into a rock face. And um, basically, there aren't 100 rows, but they stopped counting at 80 on thought we'll call it 100. <laughs> so, um, but in the upper levels is where the, the posh people live, and down in the bottom is where all the dregs of society live. And I had a, a, a lad from the bottom of society who, on a day, went up into the upper levels, witnessed the murder, and became blamed for the murder. So ended up, and I, I, I had great fun here because I mixed in. Um, I, I mixed in uh, Roman uh, gladiator type um, people. I I had flying policemen. I called kite guards. I had um, rogue gen genetic engineers living in the, the um, bowels of the city. I had all sorts of things going on, and, and and tremendous fun with it. But that all came about because I was writing something completely else, a different. And on the local news, a program came up about Burley House, which isn't far from us, and it was showing you that the top of Burley House was deliberately designed to be aesthetic for the roof, so that you could look in one direction, get a fantastic view, and they had crenellated chimneys and other adornments deliberately designed to give you a panoramic and aesthetically pleasing view. And I just thought, wow, what happens if you translate that to a whole city? And so that's where the city came about. And then what happens if you have so-called demons living in the upper, in the very roof? And, and I had the idea of this guy from the uh, lower realms coming up and witnessing a murder. And so that's what I started. I started writing that, and instantly, so many things were shooting off. I thought, this is a novel. It turned out to be a trilogy, but it starts <laughs> out as a novel. But I, I knew that one had legs to be something a lot longer and a lot more involved. And so, yes, it, sometimes it. And, and the thing about a short story is you can get away with a minimal of world building. It still has to be convincing, but you can do it with a few, almost like a painter doing brush strokes or something, that they, you, they suggest the form and leave the viewer, or in our case, the reader to fill in the rest of it. And so in a short story, you can do that and be very, very, still have to be concise, but you have to be, you can um, get away with being quite casual sometimes in some of your world building, as long as it holds together and supports the narrative. And you can get away with the one idea story, which you can't do with a novel. With a novel, you have to have multiple things going on. Yeah. Okay, so you write across genres as well. So what are your favourite things about writing in fantasy and writing in science fiction? Now there's a good question. Um, I've, I've, I, science fiction is my first love. I grew up reading and writing uh, uh, um, for my pleasure, my own uh, personal enjoyment, and not for public consumption, but, but science fiction from a very young age. And I grew up in the golden age of so-called, sort of like of Asimov, Zelazny, Van Vocht and all the rest of it. But at the same time I was reading Moorcock and I was reading these other people. Um, the definitions between the two are very blurred. And, you know, it, it used to be that put a spaceship in, it's science fiction. 
put a dragon in its fantasy. But it's not quite that straightforward now. And um, I, I think uh, quite often what I do crosses between the two. Um, and I, I don't, obviously there are when you're writing, I mean, something like the City um, of Dreams and Nightmare, that was a real mix because I had cyberpunk, I had steampunk, I had everything in there, I had monsters living in the river. I, I just went to town and, and in the second book I followed um, the course of a river which I based very much on the um, Ganges. And I did a lot of research into the Ganges and had the, the people go outside the city and things. So both allow your imagination to go wild. If you're writing science fiction, particularly near future science fiction, you have to look at something, or, or for me, I, I say you, me, I have to look at something which catches my attention in current society and think, what if that was projected forward? What if that takes us 10, 20, 50 years and it goes to an extreme? What if this trend goes further? Now, if you're writing that, you can't extend that one thing in isolation because it's going to affect the rest of society around you. So you then have to imagine, okay, well that's going to make that go this way, that go this way. And I love looking at what's going on now and pushing the boundaries of where it could lead to. Um, fantasy, you don't have any of that. You have a lot freer reign to create your own world. Um, the series that I had the, the biggest success with was um, the Pelquins comic books. Um, and they were pure far future space opera where I could throw almost every rule out the window and say, so far in the future, I don't have to connect it to the current world. And that was almost right, like writing, I don't know, it's not fantasy because it is science fiction. There are spaceships, there are all sorts of things going on and there's a, I, I, I've got virtual drugs being used and all sorts of things. Um, but it's the freedom that both give you in different ways and in different directions. It's the freedom that, when I, when I was younger, my parents read a lot of thrillers and uh, uh, John le Carre and people like this, and I tried reading them, I could appreciate the writing, but none of them stimulated my imagination. None of them got in there and made me think, wow, this could happen, that could happen, which both science fiction and fantasy did. And so that's why they're the genres that I felt at home with and why that's what I write. I don't think that answered your question, but it's the best <laughs> I can answer. So can you tell us a bit about how Yukon Press came about? <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, I joined a writers group called the Northampton SF Writers Group and they were, they were planning a convention. I had no idea what a convention was at the time. And the group was chaired by Ian Watson, which is why I joined it, because I'd read some of Ian's books and been um, very impressed by his imagination and his, um, and his use of language. So I was you know, very shy and very concerned but joined it. And they were organising this event called Newcon 3. And I went to successive meetings over a period of several months and nothing seemed to happen with actually Newcon 3 getting a nearer. So I, I became involved in helping to organise that. We held Newcon 3, but we were naive. It was a fantastic convention. Everyone loved it. All 30-odd people who turned up absolutely <laughs> loved it. But we had some great guests of honour. We had Liz Williams, John Courtney Grimwood, Fangorn, the artist who's guest of honour at Worldcon next year. And so there were guests of honour. But also, I mean, Ian was there, obviously, as another um, fully established author. Gwyneth Jones just turned up. She was among the 30. Carrie Sperring, we had a great group of people there and everyone had a great time, but the event lost money. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there, I wasn't carrying any of the debt and I felt very guilty about that. So I thought, well, what can I do to help repay? I can write, but no one's heard of me. This is before I'd had anything published. Um, so I went to all the authors who were there and said, pretty please, would you write us a story? Because we lost money and we might be able to. And they all donated, except for Gwyneth Jones, who said, only write one short story a year, you can have a reprint. And I said, oh, no, I don't want reprints. <laughs> reprints but luckily um, we then turned to Steve Baxter who and Steve was writing prolifically at the time and Steve said yeah I'll write your story so he wrote us a story we bought the book out and Ian and I edited it. Um, it it was the most amazing experience because we were both sent proof copies by the printers Ian's proof was every other page was in italics mine, mine wasn't but I had the errors in mine that weren't in his proof so quite how this so, no. but we got the book out eventually we got it done and at the end of it I held up and thought Oh, that's good. We did this. I could do it again. And so Newcom was intended to be about a book a year, supplementing my writing. Um, and here we are now, 17 years later, with 200 titles out. So, <laughs> so what are some of the things you enjoy most about running a small press? I'm sure I can think of something if I think of it. <laughs> 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 no. what, I, what I enjoy most is A, Particularly in the early days, I was getting to 
work with writers who I'd perhaps been reading for many years, never dreamt I'd um, ever meet or work with. And I was publishing stories by the likes of, um, I don't know, all, all sorts of people who I, I just couldn't imagine that I'd be working with. That was a joy and a thrill. But the other thing is discovering new voices, discovering really good writers who haven't been given a market, who for whatever reason haven't broken through yet, and being able to say, wow, this person's got real talent. Um, and being able to <coughs> publish them. And, and what I did in the early anthologies, I mix and matched. So I would have um, Pat Cadigan and Ken McLeod and Chaz Brenchley sitting alongside people no one had ever heard of. And, uh, and the hope was that people would buy the anthology for Pat and Ken, etc., and discover these other fantastic writers. And that, that gave me a real thrill. Um, and th that still remains one of the real things. I'm, I'm editing a Parsec magazine for PS Publishing, which Pete and uh, Nikki Crowther very foolishly entrusted me with. And um, we have open submission periods. And I get swamped with stories, but I generally look at every one. And some of them are rubbish. I'm sorry, but some are utter rubbish. But there are some gems in there. And there are an awful lot that are very good. But when you discover a gem, and you go back to them and they say, oh, thank you, this will be my first published story. <coughs> you think, yes. <laughs> and that's, that's such a thrill. And it, it stays the same whether that's with PS, um, Parsec, or it's with New Compress. It's, it's such a thrill to actually get a new story from an author and think you deserve a market, you deserve something. I can at least give you some exposure and introduce you to a, a readership. So that, that, that remains one of my biggest thrills. Do you find there's a difference in how you approach editing for the magazine to how you do it for anthologies? No, I, I don't at all. I mean, I, I have a very self-centric um, attitude when it comes to selecting stories. I take what I like, and if I don't like it, even if it's by someone I really admire and, and I like as a person, I'll go back to them and say, you know, really sorry, by all means submit again, but this don't, one doesn't work for me this time. Um, and what I have to hope is that my likes and dislikes are mirrored by the, some of the readership, because if not, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and so far, it seems to work okay. But no, it, it's very much a case, if I read a story and it, it excites me or it, it amuses me, but mostly it, if it surprises me, there's something that I think, wow, I didn't see that coming. Um, that's, that's something that will um, sell it. But also, it's the quality of the writing. And, and uh, I mean, there was one particular story, which I'm, I'm not going to name the author, um, but they sent me a story, and it, and it was their first story. And it was a fantastic story, for Parsec this was. But the villain in it was a cardboard cutout villain. And in the midst of this beautifully fashioned world with a fantastic central character, which drew you in, they said, they, it was like Dick Dusty, could you imagine <laughs> twiddling his moustache? So I went back to her and said, look, I really, really like this story. I want to publish it, but I can't. And I went through it all with her. And in, in, in all honesty and wonderfully, she completely took it on board. She completely rewrote the character, brought back a, a, a slightly longer version because the character was filled out more. And uh, I took it for Barsec. And that was her first sale. But before we went to print, she sold a story to Analog. So <laughs> it, you know, it wasn't just me. There was this, this person could definitely write. And, and yes, but no, no difference. It really is a case of um, good writing and good storytelling, and those are the two priorities, and they really are. <coughs> so Parsec is a new magazine, or relatively Yeah, it's, it's been out for two, two years now, Pete, two and a bit years? Yeah, two and a bit, three, maybe. Yes, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how did it feel to launch something new and bring a new periodical? There's such an important part of our um, ecosystem, writers. Well, it, it wasn't the initial plan. The, the plan was, I got this very excited phone call from Pete, one uh, just before Chris, a few days before Christmas one year, saying, Ian, how would you like to take over running a, a, an existing magazine? And I said, well, I've, I've never thought about it, um, Pete. And he said, well, look, we've got the chance to take it over, and I'd like you to run it for me. And I looked at my commitment and I said, Pete, I don't think I can. I've got so much on. But Pete is a stubborn <laughs> and very convincing individual, so he came back to me a few more times. And eventually I thought, you know what, yes. So we, we spent the next few months doing this and, and trying to get that all in place and everything. In the end, the deal fell through. But by then, I'd invested so much time and effort into this, which could have gone into new compressed people, which could have gone elsewhere. And um, I thought, this can't be for nothing. So I spoke to Pete, and he felt the same. So he th they thought, excuse my French, sod it. Let's launch our own one. <laughs> so we launched Parsec. And um, 
in retrospect, I'm very glad it went that way because it meant we are bringing a new periodical. It doesn't have any of the baggage or the expectations of an existing title. Anything that now comes good or bad out of Parsec, it's all his fault. I mean, it's all <laughs> <my> <laughs> <laughs> So how do you find that becoming a publisher and an editor has affected your writing? <laughs> um, it, it was intended, New Compress was intended to be a sideline. But it grew more and more um, pervasive is a negative word. And I don't mean to use a negative word, but it became more uh, and more um, important in, in what we were doing. And when I had the knockback on the Pelkins comic, comic novel, which um, I thought was the best thing I'd ever written, um, I thought it, was, it had Firefly vibes, it had something different, it had a completely unique take, and I thought this is going to sell really well. And when it, it nearly went to Golanz, but they turned it down in the end, I felt so demotivated and so frustrated that I thought, obviously, I'm not meant to, meant to be a novelist. And at that point, I think Newcom began to become more important. And when I went back to writing again, Newcom was still there and kept gathering momentum. So it's definitely been um, to the... Uh, it hasn't exactly helped my writing yet, yeah. running Newcom. Um, but it was a huge help when the pandemic hit, because I, I know the pandemic hit writers in different ways. I, I've published two collections of stories written during the pandemic by Neil Asher. And Neil found the pandemic an incredible um, writing experience, because he could just spend lots and lots of time writing. Um, he found it very motivating. I found it very demotivating. With everything that was going on in the world, I felt I didn't want to write. I, I didn't want to write about a future, because what was that future? And so for me, um, my writing then took a, a real hit. And I was able to pour more energy into Newcon again, still be doing creative stuff. And it was almost, um, if you like, procrastination, because I didn't have to face my writing. I could get on with Newcon. Um, I've now got that balance back again. And I'm writing, I'm writing new stories. I've got a, a novel which I'm just trying to knock into shape and things. So that's, that's great. But. Um, no, New Newcon has definitely not been to the advantage of my writing, but Newcon is its own thing and I enjoy what I do with it, so it's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so some of your own work is published through Newcon, but you also work with other presses. How do you decide what to do with which book? Oh, I, I don't decide anything. Um, the, as I say, prior to Pelquin's Comic, which was my sixth published novel, all, all the novels that come out through other, um, you know, major publishing that she has or, 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 or semi-major publishing houses. When Pelkin got knocked back, I was so disheartened by that that I thought, clearly I'm wrong about this, it's not brilliant, and I destroyed every file. I got rid of everything to do with Pelkin's comment. Um, a year or so later, I looked and thought, hmm, I haven't had a book out for a while. Maybe that Pelkin's comment wasn't so bad. Let's have a look. And I realised I'd destroyed it all. But I found the email that I'd sent to my um, agent, Simon Kavanagh, uh, Mick Cheatham's, and it had the last version of Pelkin's comment on there. So I downloaded that, went through it again, and took out another 5,000 words, and then did what I always said I'd never do, which was publish it through New Compress, because basically no, no one else wanted it. It became my biggest selling book. It knocked Genevieve Cogman's Invisible Library off the number one spot, and um, George R. R. Martin's Feast of Crow into number three on the Amazon sales <laughs> list. Um, it, it, and only, only briefly, but I have a screenshot. You better have a screenshot. Um, but it, um, so, and I, I earned more money from that book than I've done from any of the advances I got from any of the publishing houses. And I then wrote two sequels. Um, and so it wasn't, that wasn't my decision. I, I'd have loved it to come out through Goliaths, but they came back and said, we're publishing Chris Woodham's, um, Chris Wooding's, uh, series at the moment and there are so many, there are enough similarities both involve tiny crews on a ship that we don't want to do a parallel series that's similar so that that's the reason that Golans didn't quite go with it in the end but um yeah no I, I mean I did that and uh, the double-edged sword which I have brought out through Newcon that's because it was actually sold originally to a, a, another press but they'd had it for nearly three years um, Lots of promised publication dates, lots of promised final edit dates. Um, but at the, at the end of these three years, I hadn't actually seen a cover image. No date was firmed up. So I said, look, I'm really sorry. I'm taking it back. I want this to get out there. So I took it back and published it myself. So. And how lovely it is, too. Thank you. <laughs> so 
how do you do it all? <laughs> like, how do you possibly fit all of that into the? Well, I'm I'm very lucky in that I have um, I have I have quite a long journey to work in that I get up and come downstairs. <laughs> so you know, I'm not losing an hour or half an hour's travel. Um, I get up, I come downstairs, turn the computer, I make myself a cup of tea, and I start working. And then I'll work through. Helen will sometimes say, "Right, I'm putting your soup on. I'm doing you some lunch." And um, I'll take a break and have that for half an hour, go back to work, and then really I, I work until the energy levels run out. And sometimes on some days that's 4:30, but I mean I'll start work at 6:30 in the morning, 6:30 to 7. And sometimes the energy runs out at 4:30. Sometimes I work through till 6. But I am good at weekends. I only do five or six hours every day <laughs> on a Saturday and Sunday. But that's how we do it. And and Helen and I haven't had a holiday that hasn't been related to the conventional work in. No, a couple of decades, 15 years anyway. In 15 years, we just haven't had a holiday. I, I, and Hannah will tell you, Christmas morning, I get up before anyone else, turn the computer on, do a couple of hours of work. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I just, it, it has become, um, let's say that I haven't necessarily got the work-life balance quite right at the moment, <laughs> and it needs some adjusting. So how do you approach finding a balance between Parsec and Yukon and writing your own stuff? Do you have like a schedule that you stick to each day or does it depend on what's happening in each area? I would so like to say I have a schedule and I stick to it because it makes me sound so efficient and well organised. <laughs> I'd be lying through my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> it, essentially, I get up, I know there are certain things that have to be done and it's the priority. This one, I've got to get the artwork in if I want the book out to be then, so I've got to lay the cover out. I, I need to get the signing sheets out to the author here. That has to be done. I've got emails here that have to be answered from authors. So it, it's literally, there's the to-do list, and I'll see how far down it I can go before the day ends. So it, it is literally that. And when it's Parsec, I, I almost lock away two weeks to do the editing and everything on Parsec. But that's why sometimes I accept stories on Parsec, promise I'll come back to people before they're published, but they might not hear from me for several, for six, eight months, because they've I've scheduled them for an issue further down the line, and I've only just edited the one for the issue I'm doing. It it really is a as simple as that. There's the list. That's my work working through it. Right, end of the day now. I'll stop. I'll pick it up again tomorrow. So that that's how well organised and. <laughs> So with all of that, I imagine with running the press, there is literally always something to do. There's oh. always emails to answer or books yes. to send out. So how do you carve out time to write? Well, this is it. I, I haven't been of late, but um, or, or I wasn't during much of the pandemic, but I am now because I'll get up and on that to-do list, I'll put Ian's writing at the top. You know, so that would be my priority. So it, it is, and sometimes you know, I, I get commissioned for, for stories, still not as many as I used to because I haven't been writing much. But I, I'll get commissioned and think, right, that's got to be written now. I've got to, I've got to make that a priority. Um, so it, it is literally a case of slotting that into the list of priorities. I don't differentiate. I don't have, right, I'm going to do two hours of writing. I did, when I started out doing Yukon, I would say, right, the morning's going to be writing, the afternoon Yukon. But somehow that all got blurred and it merged and... <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell us about a release you've got coming up from Newcon that you're excited about? Oh, I'm sure I'm there's loads. <laughs> right. No, um, okay, I'm going to tell you a story now. Um, I'm going to tell you a story, got to sound like Max Bygraves. Uh, for, for those old enough to remember Max Bygraves. Um, yeah. And you've shown your hands as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, before, uh, at BristolCon last year, I sat down at a table and it was one of those things where you're sitting with a group of people and suddenly realise, I mean, it was myself, Helen, um, Peter Hamilton, uh, Paul Connell, Liz Williams, Jane Fenn and Justina Robson. So it's you know, quite a distinguished group of, of quite nice people, but all of whom are writers, except for Helen, who is vicariously through me. So we were there and I suddenly looked and thought, Jane, um, we keep talking about doing a short story collection, don't we? No, Justina, we keep talking about doing a short story collection, we haven't. Um, Liz, we've talked about doing a short story collection, we haven't done one for years. And, so the three of them were there, so I just said, you know, we've, we've had this conversation three, uh, uh, before, each individual with you, would you still be interested in doing it? And they all said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I then went away and I had another book in, um, which I'd recently received from a, an, an author who's unknown to anybody, um, because she's not online, she has no um, internet presence. Um, she spends more time going into the countryside, digging up rare glass, glasses, grasses and taking them home because she knows that a certain type of caterpillar feeds on this 
grass and she can cultivate that caterpillar and butterfly in her garden. She'll go out litter picking. She'll do, or, or she'll visit graveyards and churches in the area because that's what interests her. But she has no, she's not online. And I had a collection from her. So that's four female authors. And then I, uh, I, pub I published a story in Parsec um, called um, by Patrice Sarath. Um, and I was knocked out by this story. I thought it was one of the best written pieces I'd read for years. So I just approached Patrice and said, I know she had a short story, but I suddenly started finding that I had this collection of, um, or this list of, of potential collections, single author collections, all by outstanding authors, all of whom happened to be women. And so I thought, this, there's a theme going on here. <laughs> so I've launched Pole Stars, which launched with Jane Fenn's collection being number one. Um, I can't remember number two. It was a, oh, Taker! Taker Maria <laughs> Smith's collection, umbilical number two. Emma Coleman, who I was talking about, as number three. Um, and Emma writes some um, sort of rural horror and um, mythologically based fantasy, all based in Northamptonshire, which is where she lives. So that's three. Uh, we, these three are now out. We've got the next three coming out at Christmas, health and other things permitting, which is um, Justina Robson. Um, Alia Whiteley and uh, Patrice Sarath, this American author. We've got stretching on next year into next year. We've got Sarah Lotz, Judah, T. McKenna. We've got all these authors all coming out in the Pole Stars collection. So that's something I'm very in, um, excited about, very thrilled about. Um, yeah, I mean, let, let's hope that they do well because they're all fantastic writers. Many of them well known. There's another one as well we've got coming up called Rose Biggin. And Rose will be unknown to many people here, but she's a marvellous writer. And we saw her, I, I was on a, a, a bill for something in London many years before the pandemic um, came about, where I was doing a reading, it was done by Unsung Stories, and it was myself, Ed Cox, the Golan's author, Rose and another author. And, um, oh, Tom Tone, was it? Tom was the other one. Um, so we, we did the... Um, the readings and mine went down very well. Lots of people came up and asked about it, which was great. Rose finished it and she didn't read her story, she performed it, didn't she? And it was just, oh my god, you were living through this story of the North Wind meeting and over maps in old, and you could almost smell the tap room, and it was just brilliant. And I've always admired Rose, she's done a few bits for me. But when I was doing Pulse, I thought, right, I've got to get Rose on, on board. So we've got this fantastic lineup of incredible, incredible collections coming out in batches of twos and threes over the next um, year or so. I've got enough to go on now till the end of next year and into the following. Well done. That's <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And I can feel my bank balance getting smaller. Yay! <laughs> That's what we like to hear. <laughs> okay, so can you give us a pitch for the double-edged sword? A, a pitch? Yeah, Buy it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the double-edged sword, I've, I've had a, a character I've written short stories about for many years who is never named. He's called The Fallen Hero, and he was a member of a very successful mercenary band who um, basically he fell out with the leader after punching him on the nose after a, deal, after a job went wrong and got put in prison. He's now very bitter, and he, this guy is a complete scallywag, a complete um, anti-hero. He's everything you wouldn't want to be in a person. Um, but he's living in a very real and a very difficult world, and that's his, the way he views it. He does what he has to get by. But my favourite, um, and I should say, it's deliberately, there's plenty of dark humour in it. Um, it's, it's intended to be um, entertaining, it's intended to be fantasy, it's intended to be sword and sorcery, but humorous as well. And I was, my, sorry, I know one or two of you will have heard me say this before, but one of my favourite ever reviews went up on one of the online sites, and it was by a gentleman who said, um, I'm ashamed to say I loved the central character in this book. As a pastor, I should not like anyone who lies, murders, <laughs> deceives. These are all the things I preach about on my, from my pulpit on a Sunday. But I found it riveting, and it's an excellent story. So, and that has to be one of the best endorsements ever going ever. Um, so it's and and some some bloke called Adrian Tchaikovsky said a cheerfully brutal story of betrayal and skullduggery. That's where I got the word from skullduggery. There you go. Vicious from start, start to finish. Um, it's it's a, a book I'm very proud of. It's entertaining, hopefully, and I think I cram an awful lot into a novella. 
I think I can, I, I, I'm happy with the world building because it's a world that's established in my mind. So I'm able to portray that, and I think that comes through in the writing. And um, I like to think there's not a word wasted, that it all works well. But yes, I would say, buy it, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's my pitch for the double-edged sword. So do we have any audience questions? Yes. Dave. Yes. Uh, time for a reading strictly for pleasure. Is it possible? If it is, please explain how. <laughs> <laughs> I was finding it incredibly difficult because I, I used to, I mean, I got into this game because I used to read copiously. Yeah. And the one thing I don't have time to do to re is read now. Yes, and this too. is why a few years ago, when I was approached by Tom Hunter and asked, do you want to be a clerk judge? Um, I said, yes, because then I suddenly had to set aside time to read. Mm -hmm. And it got me back into the habit of reading again. Um, having judged the Clark Award for one year, I then discovered that I was completely burnt out on science fiction. We had a, 104 novels submitted in that time. So I started reading old Penguins. I've got, I went to, on eBay and got a load of old Penguin books, some by authors I really ought to have read and hadn't, and started reading those just to get away from genre. And then the next year Tom said, you know it's our um, 50th or 20th anniversary, we want to do a special um, thing, why don't you come on board and be a judge again? I thought, well I wasn't thinking about it now, go on then. And that got me then back into reading science fiction. So it, it's something you just have to set aside time to do. My problem is, that I sit down, having worked for, for you know, six, seven hours pretty solid, sit down, open a book and three pages in, I fall asleep. That's my <laughs> biggest problem, but yes. I, it, it's something I, I, I've literally had to um, schedule into the day to find, otherwise it doesn't get done. Yeah, I find the same problem. <laughs> That's why I got involved in being on a panel for the uh, British Fantasy Awards a few years running. It's the only time I've read anything that I wasn't either <coughs> book to review or publishing. Yeah, yeah, I can sympathise. You were saying about with the pandemic how it basically stopped you from writing, and I know a lot of authors had problems with that. The thing is now, now after it, it's not gone away, and it seems to keep coming back. But how has it affected your writing after the pandemic? What sort of things have I, I don't come think it, it, I don't think it actually has affected my writing as such. I mean, it, possibly on some of the themes, and if I'm writing near future, you have to mention the pandemic, otherwise you're not writing anything relating to our world. But I think the human as a, humanity as a species is incredibly resilient. And when we went into the pandemic, it was almost as if this is the end of the world. You know, life is never gonna be the same again. We'll, we'll never ever come up with anything resembling what the normality we had beforehand. It's all gonna be so different. But we somehow managed to accommodate it and move on. And yes, of course, we're still taking precautions at times. Of course, we're very conscious of new variants, but it's almost, it's almost become part and parcel of normal life now. Whereas, of course, it was this incredibly different thing. And I think because of that, it's not really affected the tone or, or my approach to writing as such. It's just another factor you have to be aware of in if you're doing a near future story. Other than that, no. Thank you. Tika. Ian. Hi. Um, I'm just I'm not writing anything at the moment, but yes, there certainly is, uh, is um, a sequel planned. I, in my mind, I've had for some time an overriding story arc for this character, which I didn't have when I wrote the initial stories. Um, it, they were just short stories involving this character. But then when I wrote one particular one, and I could see where the story was going. So um, there is definitely a story arc. This novella actually came out the very first short story I wrote about the character which um, forms most of the first chapter, and you've got a section of actually in the programme book. Um, that was a short story, one of the first short stories ever sold. But I always thought, in the back of my mind, what happened after that? Where did he go from there? And so this novella takes it from there and tells a whole new story involving characters who cropped up before. And yeah, so it's, it's, there will be more, there will be more. Yeah. And thank you for the compliment, by the way, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Sean. I've got a question for Ian. Yeah, I, I see you sort of have, in a way, four interconnected roles, if you, if you don't mind my analysing. First of all, you as a writer, mm -hmm. self, and in the early days, someone else published it, whereas now you can't press your imprint, does it? That's the first one. The second one is, as an editor, someone else's work, 
and obviously you're under contract to them, not going to do, and that's the back and forth between you and the, the writer typing up a word here, emphasizing there, and so on. That's the second side. The third one is the production side, actually, the books themselves, getting the printer organized, the typesetting, coming back with the proofs, make sure things are laid out properly, getting covers done. And finally, your presence here at conventions. Now, the burning question is this is the thing. If you had to choose one of the four, oh. <laughs> this is naughty, but you know me well. If you had to choose one, which one would you choose? I know it's a toughie. Tough, isn't it? Yeah. I, 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 four, I, I don't know. know because generally there are aspects of all of them I enjoy. Um, it would, it would really come down to either writing or, or conventions. I love conventions. I love talking rubbish to anyone. You know, it's just <laughs> so it, it would be one or the other. But don't ask me to choose between things I couldn't. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a semi-answer on that. <laughs> OK. You can take your revenge later. <laughs> or Helen will. <laughs> yes, you, you can count on it, Lally. You can count on it. Thank you. Okay, do we have any more? I think we have time for one more question. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you were saying earlier, when you used to send off stories, you suddenly get a reply so many months later. So. With also your editor hat on, how have things changed with the sort of like online and everything like that? How has that changed um, writing as well as um, producing words for other people as well? Well, from my perspective, we yeah. mean all the writing, all the writing oh, I'm getting in. However you want to answer it, yeah. Um, well, from from my perspective, it hasn't changed anything on the writing front. It's just a case of I can now get my stories to sources. I mean, in, in this year when I decided I was going to have um, 30, uh, 12, uh, a story a month published and rejected, um, pub published and written in the, you know, one a month. Um, we ended up with, I think I wrote 13 stories as mentioned, I sold 13, but to sell those 13, at this stage it was fairly old in my career, I must have probably got 100 rejections. And that was because I was sending them out, getting them back, looking at the story, taking loads of any editorial notes, revising it myself, sending it out again, getting it back. So it, it's the turnaround of, of that's, that's changed not the stories themselves. Um, I was, uh, when I started out, I was selling one in 11 submissions, roughly. So it, it, was, uh, it was really was a numbers game. But you have to be very thick-skinned. Um, and that's how it has to change, certainly. You, if, if, if a rejection's gonna hurt you, don't be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it didn't affect my writing as such. How, how's it affected, though, um, you on the, the publishing side? It, the, the biggest thing is that you, um, I, <laughs> I get swamped with submissions. I was talking to some people with, um, uh, about this uh, earlier. I get swamped with submissions, and for Parsec, I'm getting in three, four hundred submissions over the course of a couple of weeks. And when you're getting that sort of um, figure in, obviously you want to take the best stories, but you're almost looking for, the, for reasons to reject something. You know, and if someone gives you an excuse, that's great. So what you end up with is you'll have a story through, and it'll be there, and it will have no name on, it'll have no contact details, it might be in the email, but you've just downloaded one of 300 stories, and you open up a piece, it doesn't tell you who wrote it, it doesn't tell you how to contact them, so you have to start looking through emails to find addresses, and, and that isn't exactly making me think, great, I'm really happy this person you know, wants me to do the work of, of, of the, the terribly complicated work from his perspective of typing his name, which is clearly difficult for him. You know? <laughs> so it, it's, it, it's people need to pay attention to what they're doing. Just give the submissions. Yes, when yeah. you're submitting, give the, you don't give the editor a reason not to want to publish your book. So you put your name, you put your address, you put your contact details, a word count, estimated word count. The, the word count won't be the one the editor goes on, but it gives him an idea of whether he's about to read a novella or a flash picture. You know, it, it's this type of thing. Give the editor what they want as much as you can before to make their job easier. I do lie, don't I? Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> we had one. For, we had a that word count lying. listing. It went you from five to ten thousand. Somebody sent a, a story. It's a word count ten thousand. I actually checked the word count. It was thirteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I could chat with you all day, but I'm afraid we are out of time. Yes. So thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to speaking to you again over the course of the weekend. Definitely, you know where to find me. I'll be in the dealer's room, anyone wants to come and laugh, you know, <laughs> stuck behind a table doing stuff. You know. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me waffle on this. Greatly appreciated. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.